Welcome to your first glider ground school. I'm Armin Charbonneau, CFI, Certified Flight Instructor, Glider, um, at the Soaring Society of Boulder. And uh, this ground school is intended for folks who have never flown a glider before or have just started flying gliders. Uh, it is uh, a first ground school. Uh, but I think a very important one uh, so that one is well oriented when they get to the glider and start their training. I'm going to go through these slides uh, fairly quick to keep the ground school brief, knowing that you can stop and rewind, easily stop and rewind at any point um, and, and see the see the graphics, read the, read the words, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, hopefully that'll help you. YouTube seems to be a wonderful tool uh, for doing this sort of thing. This is a ground school that I will have all my uh, first time students, primary students watch, uh, along with a series of others. So without any further ado, uh, Let's talk about what the topics are going to be on this ground school. First is section is what you should know before your first flight lesson. Uh, show up for your first le for flight lesson prepared. Uh, next one is on the cockpit instruments, what, what we're going to find in the cockpit. Uh, pilot instruments. Uh, you actually go to the airport with pilot instruments, so we'll talk about that. The sources of lift, but you know, gliders don't have engines, so uh, we need the atmosphere. Uh, and uh, there's four sources we're going to talk about. Uh, soaring in Colorado. Um, I live in Colorado. Obviously, Soaring Society of Boulder is based in Colorado. It's a wonderful place to fly and we'll uh, fly gliders, and we'll talk about that. No uh, ground school is complete without a quiz, so uh, we'll, we'll be going through that. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how to get how and where to get your glider rating and what I look for in a student glider pilot. First, a glider is not an airplane without an engine. It's a different flying machine. Uh, the wings are long and skinny to minimize induced drag. And that low induced drag allows gliders to soar. And what induced drag is, uh, is actually lift going in the opposite direction of the flight. So the higher our angle of attack, which we'll talk about later, uh, the more induced drag an airplane or a glider has. The glider at the top, you can see, has kind of short, fat wings, and the higher performance glider has long, skinny wings. So making the wings skinny like that helps the glide it helps the induced drag, lowers the induced drag, increases uh, the, the glide ratio. And you can see here, this one with the fat wings has a glide ratio of 22, whereas the, the high performance glider uh, can be 60. And that is uh, the number of feet or meters or whatever you want to say uh, across the sky versus how many do you drop down. So. So at any rate, why is there lift? Well, lift's created by air as the, as the glider goes soaring through the atmosphere. Uh, the, the wind, the air underneath the wing will push the wing up from below. And for you with a science background, you know that's Newton's third law for every action there's equal and opposite. Uh, the pressure difference, because of the shape of the wing, uh, the pressure is lower, and you can see low pressure up here. The pressure is actually a little lower on the top of the wing and higher at the bottom of the wing. Um, I like to say that's Newton pushing up from the bottom and Bernoulli pulling up from the top. <laughs> so, but a glider, without an engine, of course, is always descending through the air mass. Gravity is working on it 100% of the time. And it descends through the air mass, even if the air mass is moving up faster than the glider is sinking. 
Now that's what we have when we have lift. We, the air mass is moving up faster than the natural sink rate of the glider, and the glider gains altitude. So there has to be a forward component of lift that makes the glider move forward, and that is lift, because as we're seeing here on this lower uh, diagram, the lift is not straight up. It's actually a little bit forward. So there's a component of lift that's up and a component of lift that's forward. And that's due to gravity. So it's gravity does uh, a few things for us in soaring. One, it makes us land eventually, but it also pulls us forward uh, because we fly, we soar. Um, angle of attack is something that the FAA wants to make sure every pilot uh, regardless of what they're flying, understands. And you can see the diagram of this wing, and it shows the angle of attack. And as that angle increases, the angle of attack increases. And so does the lift and the drag, uh, specifically the induced drag, gets increased uh, with increasing angle of attack. And the higher the angle of attack, the higher the lift, and the lower the airspeed. If the, air, if the angle of attack exceeds the critical angle of attack, the airfoil stalls and lift ceases. Um, gliders have several airfoil surfaces, wings, of course. Uh, horizontal and vertical stabilizers are also um, uh, and ailerons, uh, rudder, elevator. These are all lifting surfaces uh, that uh, cause the glider to change direction and put pressure on the, around the uh, center of gravity uh, to make the glider move. And here's how they move. Um, there's three types, there's only really three ways you can uh, move a glider, and that's pitch, roll, and yaw. And the pitch would be up and down uh, around that lateral axis. The elevator, shown in red, does that for us. So if that goes up, the tail goes down, and nose goes up, uh, and the angle of attack increases. Uh, we can also roll the aircraft along what's called the longitudinal axis here and here, and the ailerons cause that roll. Yaw is something uh, that is much more pronounced in glider than it is in airplane. And so we need to really understand in a glider, glider pilot really needs to understand why the, why the glider yaws, which way it yaws, and how to use that rudder. So glider pilots have to use their, their feet uh, on the rudders to control the yaw, to make it go point in the direction we want it pointed. So why does a glider turn? Well, the glider, just like it moves forward because of, of lift and gravity, when the, when the glider turns, it changes its direction of lift from up to over here. In this case, uh, we're looking at it. It's, if you were in the glider, it look right, but to us, it looks left in this picture. And the, the lift pulls the glider around the turn. So, when you bank, you've changed that direction of lift and thus you turn in a glider. So when a glider turns, now the outside wing uh, has a higher angle of attack and it's also moving faster. Those two things create more lift, but also more drag on the, on the outside wing, which causes it to turn away from the turn or yaw away from the turn. Now, we would like the glider to turn around like the shape of a soup bowl, like if we're in a soup bowl and just turn like that. But the problem is, is the nose gets pulled in the wrong direction because of this extra drag that's on the outside wing. It's showing here a, a small arrow here and a bigger arrow showing more drag. And that's <laughs> because of a few factors, the outside moving far, faster, the aileron versus down versus up on the inside. And all that creates more drag. 
and that is called adverse yaw. So the glider not going around, the nose not going around and, and perfectly coordinating is called adverse yaw. Now on airplane, it's not very pronounced because the wings are shorter, but on a glider where we have long wings, where we talked about the long wings, well, because of that, we have uh, more we have more pronounced adverse yaw. And we correct that adverse yaw by using the rudder. And you have to learn as a glider pilot how to fly coordinated. And so you turn both using the ailerons the on the stick and also coordinating that with the rudder, uh, which you would control with your feet. Good coordination makes for smooth glider flights and uh, a happier instructor in my case. Now, adverse yaw <laughs> sounds like a, a small angry man. And uh, when I picture him, this is kind of what I picture is going on out on the wing. And uh, we've got this rascal out there and he's pulling the wing in the direction we don't want to go. Uh, and so we have to use the rudder to kick him off. Cockpit controls. All right, uh, this is a picture of, a, of an ASK-21, uh, which is the glider that uh, we train with in, uh, at uh, Soaring Society in Boulder. And there's a few things. Uh, first one that probably jump out at you is the stick, which of course with gliders, we, we fly with sticks. Uh, there's a trim lever here. You see the green uh, knob on the end. Uh, we wanna be able to take the pressure off uh, and keep the glider as stable as possible. Over here, this handle is the spoiler, which comes out of the top of the wing and, and spoils the lift. And then at the very end of that, there's a wheel brake, uh, which obviously will work on the ground, uh, but not in the air. Uh, we have a microphone, and on the top of the stick, there is a button, push to talk button. So you push that, talk into the microphone, and other pilots can hear uh, where you are. The tow release, this yellow, and uh, the yellow is the release. You only pull that when you're ready to release or either hook up or release the tow plane, uh, the rope for the tow plane. Rudder pedals, you can kind of see them out here, and that's uh, what we use to control adverse yaw and make coordinated turns. The instruments that we use, uh, that a glider uses, um, in some cases can be pretty minimal, although in other cases uh, they can look minimal but be very sophisticated instruments. Uh, first one over here, airspeed indicator, uh, we're showing that. Um, obviously we wanna know how fast we're going through the air. If we're going too slow through the air, uh, we could stall. If we're going too fast, we could break up the glider. And there are some very, uh, you know, uh, speeds that are appropriate for landing. We want to use those. Altimeter, we want to know how high we are. Remember, the altimeter is only going to tell us how high we are above sea level. Uh, we need to know how high we are above the ground, which as a glider pilot, you'll be trained uh, just to look at the ground and have a pretty good idea. Compass, we need to know which way we're going. This glider has a G meter. Um, those are usually used uh, if there's going to be some acrobatics or whatever. Variometers. This glider has two variometers, uh, and the, the variometer will tell you whether the glider is uh, in lift or sink. And uh, remember, the glider is always sinking through the atmosphere, so we want to know where that lift is. And we want to see this instrument going up and knowing that we're in the lift. And then we can fly the glider appropriately for that condition. Radio, uh, important. We want to be able to make sure everybody knows where we are and then coordinate landings and things with other gliders. Yaw string. The yaw string uh, is a pretty simple instrument. It's typically just a piece of yarn uh, taped uh, to, the, um, to the canopy, which seems to be the case here. And that yaw string tells us if we're coordinated or not. So if the yaw string goes off to this side, you wanna use the rudder to pull it straight. Or if it goes off to this side, you use the left rudder to pull it straight. 
Now, pilot instruments. When you will go out to the airport to fly the glider, you are bringing some instruments with you. Your eyes, your ears, your gut, and your butt. Uh, your eyes are going to be used to watch the horizon, and you need to always be watching the horizon. Uh, your ears are there to hear the pitch of the wind. Now, the glider doesn't have an engine, so you're able to hear the sound of the wind. And when that wind makes a, so what you're trying to listen for is the pitch, not the volume. Uh, humans are very good at discerning pitch. Uh, just that's why we can hear music and hear the difference between, you know, a C note and a, and a G note. Um, so your ears hear the pitch of the wind, and if you hear a very low oh, sound, you're getting closer to stall. You're getting close to about the slowest the glider can fly. And when it makes a high pitch sound like that, you're going pretty fast. So if you lose your airspeed indicator, you can land at an appropriate airspeed by listening to the sound of the wind. Um, and that's something uh, your training should include. Uh, so gut, your gut to feel coordination. Now, when I'm in the back of a glider training a student and they don't fly coordinated, it feels like somebody's pulling my stomach out to the side. So I know immediately when they're not coordinated. Uh, and I ask them to look at the yaw string <laughs> and get coordinated. Uh, gotta, gotta fly coordinated. There's, there's just, you can't fly any other way. Uh, your butt. Well, that's actually your, your CG, your center of gravity, your, the pilot's center of gravity. And your, the pilot's center of gravity will actually feel lift and discover lift before the instruments will. Um, it's uh, interesting. We feel ourselves going up and down, and uh, just like you do in an elevator, and you know that elevator started to move. Uh, the um, same thing happens. So our center of gravity is where we feel that. Our gut is where we feel if we're coordinated. Our ears are how fast we're going, and our eyes are watching the horizon to know everything's okay. So thermal so soaring. So here's. Four sort, we're going to go through some sources of lift here. Uh, the first and, and perhaps the most common is thermal soaring. And there are thermals out there, especially in the summertime. Uh, and those are columns of air that are moving up. And so the glider will go into one circle and climb, still sinking through the atmosphere, but the atmosphere, the, the air mass is moving up. So it climbs up. And then you go to the next one, do the same, you know, and you go to the next one and, and uh, do the same thing. And then you see the glider here, it's losing altitude as it gets to the next thermal. Now, you can see that in order to get from here to here, the best way to do it is not necessarily a straight line. Ridge soaring. Um, if you have a, a ridge, that is perpendicular, or roughly perpendicular, to the direction of the wind. Uh, you can fly your sailplane along the uh, along the ridge, along the side of the ridge, because the wind is moving up on this side. Now, uh, conversely, on the other side of this ridge, that wind is moving down. So, if you're flying a sailplane, you want to be on the upwind side of the ridge. Uh, certainly not the downwind side of the ridge. This type of soaring is very common. Uh, in the eastern United States along the Alleghenies, which mountains which tend to run north and south. And um, third type is mountain wave. Um, mountain wave is more complicated to understand. It's beyond the scope of your first ground school. Uh, but you need to know that, that um, there are waves and they are triggered by wind blowing across the mountain and they cause a lot of turbulent rotor. Uh, one, is, one thing that glider pilots tend to know about that airplane pilots don't know about is rotor. And sometimes airplane pilots fly into this weather phenomenon and have no idea what happened. Uh, glider pilots um, know if they want to get into it, how to get into it, and if they don't, how to stay away from it. Uh, this is a tremendous source of lift 
that can take you way above um, 18,000 feet, which is the uh, limit that we can fly, that the FAA lets us fly. So uh, a lot of caution uh, in mountain wave soaring, but also a heck of a thrill when you get it. Convergence. Convergence is probably the hardest to understand, uh, uh, or at least it was for me the hardest to understand of these four types. The easiest way to think about it is at the ocean where you have a sea breeze, and there's a different air mass over the ocean. The ocean doesn't heat and cool as rapidly as the land. So in the morning, the land starts to heat up and uh, becomes a, different, a warmer air mass. And then the um, colder air mass over the ocean slides under it because it's heavier. And cold air mass is heavier than warm air mass. And so it slides underneath. And when it slides underneath, it forces the warm air up that creates uh, lift. And you can fly your sailplane along the convergence. So let's put this all together. Um, talk about it in Colorado, uh, specifically flying out of Boulder. Uh, it's one of the best places on the planet for cross-country soaring. Uh, there's tremendous lift out over the mountains and um, both, well, all the types that we've talked about, you know, there's lots of thermals. The, the sun heats up the sides of the mountains, triggers thermals. The uh, wave, the wind can cause wave. Uh, we get convergence because the air masses are different. And there is some ridge soaring. Uh, we don't do a lot of it. Usually in Colorado, if you're ridge soaring, uh, you're, you're too low. Um, so uh, we, we soar at pretty high altitudes here and we don't like to get low because it's kind of, kind of disconcerting uh, to be below the mountains. Uh, SSB club member and president, uh, Clemens Seipik, uh, made this 650-mile soaring flight from Boulder in 2021. Uh, he has since done an even more spectacular triangle, um, which uh, I'll have to update this someday soon to show. But um, SSB, or Soaring Society of Boulder, pilots racked up the following online contest statistics in 2021. 44 pilots soared 138,000 miles. Um, 16 pilots had average flights longer than 200 miles, and SSB finished second in North America and ninth in the world for LLC points scored, online contests points scored. As you can see from this flight, this 650 mile flight, it formed something of a triangle, which uh, we like to do and we get more points on LLC. So this is a spectacular flight uh, done by a great pilot, and um, but it's, it's doable. All right, the quiz, you know, got to have a quiz. So why do gliders have long, skinny wings? Minimize induced drag. All these uh, can be answered in a few words or less. In some cases, just one word. And as we go, as we do more ground schools, I'm going to emphasize the need to use FAA terminology. And there usually will be a, a word or a few words uh, that answers the question. And when you uh, get ready to take your check ride, those are the answers you want to give. Uh, what force makes the glider move? Remember, it's gravity. And what are the three rotations? Three rotations of the pilot control? Pitch, roll, and yaw. What force makes a glider turn? Well, lift. We bank the glider to redirect the direction of lift, and it makes us turn. And why do gliders need to use a rudder for coordinated turns? Counteract adverse yaw. Remember adverse yaw? Up there on our wing. And what are the four pilot instruments? Your eyes, your ears, your gut, and your butt. And what are four types of lift a glider can use? Thermal, ridge, Wave, convergence. Is Colorado a great place for soaring? Yeah, it certainly is. And bonus question. When does a glider rise through the air mass? You all should know this. Never. 
Okay, what to expect from your glider training? Well, you have to be at least 16 years old to get a license. Uh, you can solo a glider at 14, but uh, you can't get the license to you're 16. Uh, you got to be able to communicate English. Uh, you got to be self certified to be medically fit. Uh, glider pilots do not have to have medical certificates like airplane or helicopter pilots do, uh, but you have to uh, self certify yourself that, that you're medically fit to fly. You have to pass an FAA knowledge exam, and you have to receive <coughs> flight training, minimum 10 solo flights, and minimum 10 hours. Um, of training and you have to pass an FAA practical exam and that FAA practical exam will include both an oral portion where the examiner will ask you questions uh, which you should answer succinctly with the FAA terminology. Uh, I tell people there's the right answer, the wrong answer, and the FAA answer and if you want to pass your flight exam use the FAA answer. Um, and then there's a flight portion of it too. So, but if you don't pass the oral, you don't get to go, you don't make it to the glider. Uh, the, the exam's over. Uh, amount of training flights before first solo, nobody can tell you that. Uh, it varies widely by the individual. And, uh, but expect uh, at least your age in training flights if you're under 40. If you're older, it might take, it might take more uh, than your age. Uh, this is for folks who have never flown anything. Uh, pilots who have been flying airplane uh, for some time or helicopter, uh, and they might be over 40. Yeah, they, they can pick it up pretty fast. If, we call that transition pilots. And if you're transitioning from another uh, license, um, uh, the guys my age <laughs> can do it just fine. Uh, cost per flight. $50 to $150, depending on the tow height, the time, the operator, et cetera, uh, whether the instructor charges or not. So it can be a pretty wide range for each flight. Uh, but if you, if you want to do this, I mean, plan to fly twice a week while you're training. Uh, you got to stay sharp. You got to learn it. Um, you should not drag it out. Types of organizations that offer glider training, clubs, uh, like Sorry Society of Boulder. Now, they usually will have some instructors, but clubs, the instructors are, you know, it's like trying to herd cats and the instructors do what they want to do. and uh, It's a little harder. Uh, Fixed-based operators, uh, they're commercial. You know, you, if you want to go Tuesday at, you know, a certain time, uh, they should have, they, they can arrange to have somebody there for you to, to train. So, you got a lot more flexible schedules uh, with a fixed-based operator. So here's some resources for our Soaring Ground School. Um, the Glider Flying Handbook, it's a must-read. Uh, it's easy to get. You get it on the internet. It's probably better to buy a printed copy, but um, anyway, you'll, either way, uh, whatever you want to do, you need to read the Glider Flying Handbook. It amazes me uh, how good it is. And I was like thinking, how how can a you know a bureaucracy like the FAA come up with a document that's this good? And the answer, they didn't write it; <laughs> they compiled it. They went around the country and they got the best experts. They got experts in uh, various topics uh, to write, and uh, and they put it there. Uh, another way to review it, uh, I have a ground school that. Uh, some of my uh, CFI stu uh, candidates uh, put together and they went through the glider flying handbook uh, from beginning to end. And they're both career pilots in this excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, FAA knowledge exam prep. I don't teach the exam prep. Most uh, glider uh, instructors do not. The best way to do it, the best way to prepare for the knowledge exam is to um, uh, it is to get a, a an online or you know so you can get it on a CD or something if you're old school. Um, but uh, this ASA Corp, they make one. Be careful. Uh, there's other very good um, sources uh, competitors to ASA. 
who do excellent uh, work for uh, airplane, but sometimes they just they don't have the glider uh, stuff. It, gliders kind of rare compared to airplanes. So, but ASA has good. So, I'm, I'm not making any money off ASA, but it's it works for me when I needed to do some exams, and I think it's worked pretty well for my students. Um, other educational resources. Bob Wanderer has a set of books on uh, short books on learning to soar. Uh, the Soaring Society of America, SSA.org, has a whole bunch of resources. Uh, this study soaring um, website is very good. Chess in the Air uh, is a much more is, is much more advanced uh, study. Uh, Clemens uh, Sipic, our our president, who you saw a spectacular flight. Uh, he, uh, he, he, that's his website, Chess in the Air. Uh, go to it, you'll see a lot about advanced soaring, uh, not so much about uh, the basics of soaring. And then, of course, this YouTube channel that you're probably watching this on uh, on the YouTube channel right now, but <laughs> it's the Soaring Society of Boulder's YouTube channel. channel. Uh, there is a lot more uh, primary uh, soaring, uh, learning, learning to fly, learning to fly glider resources. Uh, your flight training options. Um, in Boulder, we have Mile High Gliding. Uh, they're based at the Boulder Airport. They do rides and they do flight training. They're available on a daily basis. Um, I used to instruct over there, good operation, and uh, uh, that's really a good place to start if you're, uh, especially if you're in Colorado uh, or visiting. Uh, Soaring Society of Boulder, our, our club, uh, Black Forest. Uh, Soaring Society down at Kelly Air Park. Uh, they're another club. Uh, and Colorado Soaring Association up north uh, near uh, Fort Collins and Windsor, north of Fort Collins and Windsor, uh, is another active uh, glider club in Colorado. Uh, there are year round places that you can go uh, and, and do some intensive training. So if you wanted to go to Florida or Arizona, uh, stay for a week or so, or, you know, enjoy the uh, the warmer weather in the winter, uh, you could learn soaring at those at those operations as well. So here's what I look for in a perfect in a prospective buyer student, and I accept very few students, uh, but uh, I look for ones who have, uh, as Tom Wolf said, the right stuff, uh, and and that is um, I like to see a STEM education or equivalent uh, or equivalent. I don't, I don't know what that means, but you know, it, 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 if folks are just self-taught, like maybe they have a degree, maybe they have an education in, in law or something, but they, you know, study the the aerodynamics and that sort of thing, then that's that's fine. Um, 16 to 30 years old, if new to aviation, uh, it the younger folks pick this up a lot faster than folks my age. It, um, and of course, any age, if you're already licensed in uh, airplane or, or helicopter. Um, live near Boulder, Colorado. Uh, obviously, you need to be in the area. Uh, ready to train in the off-season. And that the off-season would be September through April. Um, you know, when it's soaring season and it's prime soaring season, I'm going to go soaring. I'm going to go fly my glider. I'm uh, sorry, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. So learning to try to plan to train in the off season will be a lot easier to find an instructor you you know especially an instructor assuming you want an instructor who, who flies cross country in the summer um, a passion to learn soaring flight and uh, I guess I want the student to want to do it uh, sometimes I've seen uh, students who are doing it because their parents want them to do it and that's a that's a terrible student. I don't, I don't want that student. Uh, be prepared to fly twice a week. Uh, get sharp, get, you know, stay with it, make it fast. Uh, because I'm not saying to rush it, but be consistent, fly a lot. That's, it makes a big difference. Uh, desire to train and fly cross country after getting a pilot's license right now. I'm not interested in training somebody who wants to just solo a glider and be done with it. Um, check it off their bucket list. Uh, I want pilots who are 
understand like, wow, this is very interesting and I can use the atmosphere to stay up and I can go fly over the mountains and I can um, go experience these things and, and I want to go do it. That's the student I'm looking for. Also, someone who wants to be a contributing member at Soaring Society of Boulder. You know, somebody who says, well, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm paying my dues, but the lawn needs to be mowed, so I'm going to grab the lawnmower and, <coughs> and mow the lawn, or I'm going to help do hookups, or I'm going to, you know, volunteer for things, be on the board, whatever, uh, be a contributing member at SSB. So if you meet these criteria, uh, you can drop me an email. But like I say, I, I don't. I only am going to take a few students a year, uh, but um, if you're uh, interested in uh, in Boulder and in Science Society of Boulder, we'd like to hear from you. Um, anyway, if you think it's like all this that you have to go through is worth it, uh, is it worth all the aggravation, the expense, the the, the moments that are will really catch your attention or a little sportier than you than maybe you thought you were getting into. Well, here's a picture of a student pilot after his first solo. And you know, uh everybody I've soloed comes back really happy. And uh so uh it is a great thing to do. Uh it is a lot of work, it is money, um it is, you know, it'll get your heart beating a little faster at times. <laughs> But uh, if you if you uh, if you if you follow it and you get to the point where this this young fellow uh, got to, uh, then you'll you'll see that. So at any rate, um, thanks so much for uh, watching this uh, uh, your first ground school for coming to your first ground school, and uh, I wish you the best in uh, in finding a place to go fly gliders and an instructor to. To teach you and uh, we'll see you in the air.